Hi, this is Megha Joshi, the host of the Boardroom Zen podcast. This show is created for the ambitious business leaders. Are you someone wanting to play big? Want to possess a strong brand and executive presence that makes you belong in every room you walk into? In all of this, without putting your personal life on hold? If the answer to those questions is yes, then you are in the right place. In this show, I sit down with best-in-class leaders to distill their wisdom while sharing what helped me stand out as a Fortune 100 executive. So let's get started. Our guest today is an accomplished corporate board director with an impressive portfolio across private and publicly held corporations. She hails from Brazil and brings over three decades of expertise in global PNL management technology and C-level advisory across 25 countries. Her leadership roles include serving as the CEO of Mandela Global Advisors, the Executives Club of Chicago, and Quan Ferry, where she successfully spearheaded the creation of a $500 million global business. Beyond her professional achievements, she's an enthusiastic triathlete, dedicated meditator, and yoga practitioner. Her diverse interests reflect in her vibrant lifestyle, and she gracefully divides her time between Florida, Illinois, and Brazil. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to none other than the remarkable Anna Dutra on our show. Anna, welcome. Thank you so much, Mega. It's a, such a pleasure <laughs> to be here with you. Love the concept. Love the idea. Thank you, Anna. And thank you for all the inspiration over the years, by the way. I remember you and I crossed paths about 14 years ago when you were visiting the business school at the Ohio State University. And I was a student back then in the business school. And you spent about an hour or so with my class, including a lot of women leaders in that space in a very intimate setting. And I can't forget the experience I had with you and all the women had with you because you were so incredibly inspiring. And especially for me as a woman of color, an immigrant that was just coming into this country, I was barely one year into this country. I think for me, you were the perfect role model that I could look up to. And over those years, I've really followed your career journey. I've sought inspiration from you. And so having you on this podcast is like a dream come true. Despite being an immigrant from Brazil, you have really retained your originality. You as a leader, when you spoke to us in that room, you were not speaking as the CEO of Corn Ferry, but rather you were speaking to us as a normal human being that we could connect with, right? It was memorable and inspiring. Inspiring. And so I'd love to hear more from you on what was, what's your secret sauce and how have you preserved that originality, the original Anna from all those decades? Well, first of all, Mega, thank you so much for bringing up such sweet memories, right? Even the fact that you say we met 14 years ago and what a gift to 14 years later our lives are still connected and we're still sharing experiences and doing things for each other. And what people don't know is that every time I still go to talk with students and to mentor women and all that, it's a two-way street. I gain as much as I give. I learn things and I feel inspired by all these people. And now there are generations younger than me, right, who are coming into a different country and having the courage to trailblaze. So, so your question is very interesting, which is how do you remain being who you are? Mm -hmm. And it's not as simple as it sounds, and it's not just connected to being an immigrant. Of course, when you're an immigrant, you're just dealing with even more complexity around yeah. different cultures and ways of behaving and all that. But let's actually go back to Brazil when I was in law school there. Yeah. And I was always super outspoken and expressive and all that. And my best friend was just like me. And we had this third best friend, so it was the three of us. And she was very thoughtful. She never raised her voice. Her pace of speaking was much 
much more mature than ours. And so many times we would catch the, the professor asking a question and we would jump out of it and, and give an answer. And she would carefully look at her pen and be reflective and then say something. And the professor would say, wow, what a thoughtful answer. And we were like, that's exactly what we said. <laughs> so my expressive friend and I said, you know what? We're going to be just like Mary from now on. We're never going to raise our voice. We're going to speak very slowly. And how long do you think that lasted? Not even an afternoon, <laughs> right? Because this, that's not who we were. So right. this, this whole quest for who you are versus who you would like to be and who you're comfortable being, but also effective. Mm -hmm. I think it's a lifelong journey. So when I came to the U.S., I can, now that I think back, it's been over 30 years, right? Yeah. I can think about phases. So the first phase was desperately wanting to melt in, mm -hmm. to incorporate, to be a part of. I remember I did accent reduction classes and mm. I watched how Americans behaved very intentively. And I said, okay, I got to speak like this. I got to talk like this. And it was so hard because it's exhausting to be somebody who you're not. Yeah. So the second phase, the next 10 years was like, hey, it's not too bad to just be who I am. And then you go all out and then you see that some things are not going to be effective because if you are much, much louder than everybody else, or if you interrupt people, they're just going to shut off and not listen to you. So yeah. you go into the third phase where I think that comes with a little bit with maturity as well, where you say, okay, where is this sweet spot where I can be who I am and be very comfortable, but also be effective, whether I am in, in a corporation or I'm with friends and arguing a point or I'm in the boardroom. And I think that that's when you find this kind of, you throw, talked about secret sauce, right? This secret sauce that doesn't violate your authenticity and your mm. principles, but is also effective as you are convey a message or selling an idea or arguing a point or, or just having fun, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah. And that makes so much sense, Anna, especially the phased approach. And I equate the third phase that you elaborated with the integration, right? We integrating who we are at our core with what we see on the outside because we're not static, we're changing and evolving. So how are we upping our game? How are we embracing skills and capabilities that allow us to be most impactful and effective? And so, and I, and I, as I listen to you, I think about the layers, right? Let's take boardroom. Sometimes people ask me, so, how do you behave in the boardroom? I would say it depends. It's probably different board by board, right? Because if I am a part of a public company board that is very formal and has assigned seats and all that, hmm, I'm going to behave in one way. But then I have the family company board that is much more informal and where the issues range from pure business to family dynamics and all that, and you behave in a different way. Even, I think that now that we're in this era, in this digital era where we have some meetings in person, some meetings are virtual, some meetings are phone only, even that affects your behavior. It's a little bit like, I'm sure you have that regarding India, right? And I have regarding South America. People put everybody on the same pot. Oh, you're South America. That means that Argentinians are the same thing as Brazilians, as Colombians. No, no. And even within the country, you have yeah. different regions and different cultures and uh, totally. different terms. So, so it's being sensitive to that. It's being super aware of who you are, but also your environments and others, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah. And you hit on the golden word, right? Being aware of mm -hmm. the situation in the environment, reading the people, reading the room, and then operating in ways that is most effective. 
And so with that, Anna, I'd love to switch gears into unpacking some of these elements around having an impeccable board career. And you clearly are one of the only people in my network that I speak to that has such an impressive board portfolio. Like really, you've reinvented yourself, you know, beyond just being the CEO for a top-notch company into now a, a woman that has this robust, healthy board portfolio. And so for somebody that's just starting out, uh, who aspires to do exactly what you did, Anna, what piece of advice or things from your journey would you share with them? I think that the first thing, Mega, is reflect on why you believe you want to be on a board, right? Because there is now this wave or this hype, everybody needs to serve on a board at some point. And one thing that I always say is, listen, there's not a one size fits all. I have friends who served on boards and said, I don't like this, not for me. So I had a very open mind. When I started to serve on boards, which was almost 20 years ago, my own board did not allow me to serve on corporate boards. So I said, you know what, I'm going to give back. Then I started serving on non-for-profit boards, foundation boards, advisory boards, and it was phenomenal for so many reasons. First of all, it helped me to understand whether I liked that type of work or not. Second, it gave me the feeling of giving back, paying it forward. But most importantly, because I liked it, it prepared me for a board career. One thing that I always tell people is that a board career is like any other career. You don't get out of college and become the CEO of a company. So you don't say, I get this call every week, right? Hey, I am thinking about retiring and I want to join a large public company board. And I say, well, tell me about your board career. Oh, I have not served on boards yet. They say, well, then <laughs> you need to start by serving non-for-profit boards, foundation boards, learn, learn the board processes. I was talking with somebody this, this morning who had never, never heard about the Robert's Rules of Governance. And I said, you know, that's the first book you read to just understand how the board processes go. And then you go into a private company board, and then you go into a small public company board, see if you like it. I actually shifted my portfolio. There was one time when my board, I always served on non-for-profit boards and always will, but there was one time when 80% of my corporate boards were public companies and 20% private. Mm -hmm. I shifted it now with 30% public and 70% private because I love all the boards that I'm in and it's that simple. The second thing is prepare, prepare yourself. This is not like any other job. It's not a job that you wing. I chair a couple of NomGov committees, so I interview a lot of uh, director candidates and one question that I always ask is, tell me what you have done to prepare yourself to serve on a board in the last couple of years. What types of certifications, training, conferences have you attended, what you're reading? And if the person says, and I get that a lot, believe it or not, it's, mm. oh, I have not had the time to do that. I was a great executive. I interacted with my board and I'm like, no, next candidate. Because <laughs> being a lifelong learner is part of being a good director. I'm always working on some new certificates or at the same time that I teach as well. And then the third thing is, for me, you have to be clear on what is important for you. For me, I look at three things every time I consider the board. The first one is, am I aligned with the mission and with the purpose of this company? And if the answer is no, that's not for me. The second is, do I understand, and in particular, am I and the people who are recruiting me aligned on how I am going to be able to add value mm -hmm. to this company, to this board, to this team? I don't want to check the box on immigrant woman, person of color, and so that the board can say, oh, mm -hmm. we add the diversity. No, I want right. to be very, is that because of my technology, my M&A background, mm -hmm. right? 
And then the last thing, which interestingly becomes more and more and more important as time goes by, is really simple. Do I like these people who I'm talking with? Mm. If the conversation is getting stale after every question and you're looking at each other and you don't want to continue. I love those conversations that we schedule for 30 minutes and then you look and you're an hour into the conversation and could get going. That's the person who I want to serve with. Yeah, and clearly your, your passion for this work exudes, Anna, because as you're speaking, I see your face light up and you know, you're, you're glowing as you're talking about these areas of opportunities. And thank you for breaking it down, right? And highlighting those three elements. First being know your why. Why are you even going after a board opportunity? Second being prepare and be a lifelong learner. And third being know what's important and answer those prerequisites of, you know, how does that board really help you as well as how do you help the board and add value? Right. And so I'd love to double click on the second piece here, Anna, on preparation, because a lot of you know, people who are new to this board career don't even know where to start or how to prepare. Is there any guidance or resources you could point them to that you feel would be helpful? There are phenomenal organizations out there whose mission is to prepare people to be really good directors, right? Because if there's one thing that I think we lack in the world in general right now is good leadership, and there is a vast of interest. The, the other thing, quite frankly, is that 10 years ago, we talked about activist investors only, right? Well, now we have activist employees. We have activist consumers. We have activist partners, we have the press. So the spotlight mm -hmm. on, on board directors is so up close and personal. So right. organizations like if you are already on any board, become an NACD member, take the NACD basic courses, seminars, they have incredible, incredible content. If you're going to focus more on privately held companies. PDA, which is a private director's association, is a phenomenal organization. If you are already on a public company board or if you're already on a board, look for the affiliation association. So we have women corporate directors, we have the Latino corporate directors association, and I'm a member there and I co-chair the educational foundation. And if you are a Latino who is a C-suite executive is not on a board yet. We have a phenomenal program called the Board Ready Institute, the BRI, mm -hmm. where we select those people who are very interesting potential board candidates, and we take them through the program. SAND for Asians, SAND ELC for African Americans, so many. I mean, there yes. are LGBTQ. So if you want to belong to an affiliation association, there are so many out there. And then there are the university programs, right? Pretty much these days, every business school has a board ready program out there. So do your research, see what you like, and perhaps your company even sponsors you. Because one thing that's becoming more and more common now for qualified potential mm -hmm. board candidates is for companies to sponsor one of those programs. It's a real perk. It's a real retention tool. Yeah, yeah. And might as well take advantage of that, as you said. Totally. And, and excellent resources there, Anna. So thank you for elaborating on them. One other burning question that came up as you were talking about these resources and alluded to certain areas was, in your opinion, is having a C-level title a prerequisite to being a candidate for a board position? So it depends on the board. It depends on what the board is looking for. The problem you're going to face here is that there is an incredible supply of talent for boards, right? And so many people who want to serve on boards who are level, who have p &L responsibility, who are global operators, and these people are probably going to be offered the public company boards positions and all that. I've served on seven public company, global public company boards, 
And in each and every case, the fact that I had run operations, that I had run businesses in several different countries was definite, definitely a plus, right? Now, does yes. that mean that if you're not at the sea level yet, you cannot serve on a board? Absolutely not. I mean, let me pick my daughter's example. She's 28 years old and she served already on three junior boards, right? So she's not qualified yet to be on a corporate board, but she served on the junior boards of yeah. Lessons in a Backpack, Sarah's Home. Yeah. She, was, she was on the Council for Latinos of, of a company she worked before. So regardless of where you are in your career, there will be an opportunity to serve on a board. And as I said, don't twist your nose to a small not-for-profit board, because I'll tell you what, my first corporate board opportunity came up because I was serving on a non-for-profit board and there was a CEO serving on that board, a small company, president actually. And what happened was that when the opportunity came up, he had seen my work, he had seen my work ethics, my commitment. He came to me and said, would you like to? And I said, of course, I'd love to be a candidate. And then I went through the process. So that's the way it starts, yeah. right? And that's so fulfilling too. As I said, to these days, I serve in a number of non-for-profit boards because it's incredibly fulfilling to give back. Yeah, yeah. And clearly, as you demonstrated in your own journey, one opportunity was the stepping stone to something bigger and better. And that also intrigues me more because what you alluded to is the power of connection and relationship building and networking. Anything you could share on that front, Anna? Listen, I am a big believer in karma and in paying it forward, right? And one thing that I'll say, by the way, anything good that you do, don't do expecting anything back, but rest assured that the universe will give it back to you in spades, right? So, so for me, it's my life philosophy is if you have an opportunity to do to do something good, to help a person. I, I always say, if you get, even if you get a call from a recruiter or from somebody about a board opportunity, and you either don't qualify or you're conflicted or you're not interested, please, please, pretty please, give three names to the person, right? Because yeah. Yeah. that person is going to be so happy because you gave some potential candidates. And what if one of them is the chosen one? Now you're spreading great energy yeah. and it's going to come back to you one day. Beautiful. And that totally resonates with me. And you know, those little selfless acts go a really long way. And we don't even realize what and how much they could mean for someone else in that moment. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and Anna, I'm also wondering for someone who is applying for board positions, who's in the pipeline, anything that, or any slew of things that they should not do is there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in that space. <laughs> so glad you asked that because I think people hear so much. Tap your network, get your word out there, say that you want it and all that. And some people don't know when enough is enough. And you don't want to build the reputation of a past in the marketplace. So yes, make people aware of what you want. Have a great set of documents. Your three most important documents are your board bio, your CV or resume, and your LinkedIn profile. They need to be consistent. They need to be well-written. They need to be appealing. Then let people know, and then just trust the system. Do your preparation, your certifications, your training sessions, but do not pastor people because the worst thing is for your name to come up as having contacted five people on a particular board saying, I would really love to serve on this board. So right. there's a fine line between being, being assertive and saying to others what you're looking for and what you want and crossing that line and yeah. becoming somebody who people will walk to the other side of the room when you walk in because they already know what the conversation is going to be about. Yeah, yeah. There's a fine line be between, as you said, being assertive and being desperate 
in those situations. And yeah, people that exude the, you know, I need this energy clearly repel those opportunities from coming their way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so this is wonderful, Anna. And anything else that you feel would benefit the new kids on the blog that are setting their eyes on the board positions? Yeah, I think that one last thing is never, never twist your nose to a conversation because you believe that that might be beneath you or there's nothing for you there. Be curious. Go have talks. You never know where the next opportunity is going to come from. You just never know. And if nothing comes out of it, that was just a nice conversation, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's sage advice. And that reminds me of the saying that you either win or you learn, right? I think I'm very competitive, so I think you can do both. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should have known going into this conversation with you, Anna. <laughs> I think you can win and learn, but also never miss an opportunity to learn from your losses too. Yeah. Yeah, right. very much you, you, so. You can learn, even if you learn about yourself. And that's all, that's, that's already a big win. It is, yes. I love how you reframe that. And wonderful conversation, Anna. As we come to the close, any parting words you may have for us? I'll leave with you something that I always tell my girls, my children, my daughters, which is, when you want to ask for something or when you're faced with an opportunity, always ask yourself, what is the worst thing that can happen, right? And I always say, provided it doesn't involve, your answer does not involve death, jail, or bankruptcy, just go for it. Just try it. I think that people lose sometimes opportunities to just throw in caution a little bit to the wind and try something new. Yeah, and I love this message of the courage in being bold. I think that question really brings out the bold spirit in people so they can set their eyes on something bigger and better as opposed to being inundated by fear. Right? Yeah, and listen, people have different tolerance for risk. Yeah. Respect that. You know yours, I know mine. But pushing the envelope just a little bit yeah, might not just hurt. Just get, get out of their comfort zone, right? <laughs> I love it. And so, Anna, I just want to say what a gift it's been to have you on my podcast, and especially someone who's been an inspiration for me over the years. Thank you so much for making time for me here and for my listeners. It means a lot. Mega, you are an inspiration. Like just the fact that you created this business where you have the courage to put the words Zen and bored in the same <laughs> sentence. Okay, <laughs> more power to you, my friend. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so thank much, you Anna. So much. What a delight. Thank you. There is no better time than now to start playing small and tap into your zone of genius. With a boardroom Zen executive coach by your side, experience the game changing transformation both internally and externally. Find out more on boardroomzen.com. And thank you for listening to my show. It means so much to me. I'd love for you to subscribe and leave a review on your favorite listening platform. More power to you and hope to see you soon.